From the campus of St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri, HEC TV proudly presents St. Louis University's seventh annual Safety Across High Consequence Industries Conference, where safety meets business. To continue with our discussion around safety, leadership, and ethics, our next speaker is Manoj Pantakar, who, as the saying goes, really doesn't need any introduction. And if one could read his full resume, you certainly would be impressed. But I'm simply going to introduce him as an individual who currently holds <coughs> his BS in Aeronautics, Aircraft Maintenance Engineering from St. Louis University, an MS in Aviation Safety from the University of Central Missouri, and a PhD in Education from Nova Southeastern. And currently is the Vice President for the Frost Campus and has accomplished a great deal uh, in the area of aviation um, safety and certainly his educational background and those other degrees he has makes him an ideal individual to carry us in for our first talk in the afternoon. So please welcome Manoj to the podium. Thank you, Ken. And now I have the challenging task of keeping everybody awake after lunch. So my one option was to just get away from the podium and walk down there and mingle with you and try and uh, run the slides from there. But I think that would really annoy our cameramen and audio specialists. So I thought, well, let me try from here and see if I can keep everybody awake for at least the first 15, 20 minutes. And then it's up to Dr. B about to wake them up. Right. <laughs> okay, I'm delighted to be here again in this capacity and, and talk about safety leadership and ethics. And I'm really excited that uh, I'll be sharing this presentation with Dr. B. About, who has been a great uh, friend, colleague, mentor, and uh, working on uh, ethics related issues and particularly uh, educating me on the philosophy uh, aspect of it. Because when I was a student, I skipped his class, I didn't take his class. <laughs> So now I'm getting to do the homework. All right. So on the agenda, I will cover three uh, main topics. The first one is uh, the safety culture pyramid. And you will hear more details about the safety culture pyramid in the next uh, session as well, uh, where Dr. Sabin and Dr. Uh, Bigda Payton will talk about the uh, safety culture pyramid in more detail, but I'll just provide some highlights. Then we'll focus on um, just culture. You have heard the term just culture introduced uh, this morning. You've also heard a little bit uh, of just culture yesterday. Uh, and I'll talk about just culture from a slightly different perspective. And then that will help us connect back to the uh, core philosophy behind uh, the just culture concept. And then the last point is uh, about practical wisdom in safety leadership. Now, practical wisdom is a term that has been coined by Dr. B about, and I'm uh, simply trying to apply it uh, to our role as leaders in, whether you're in aviation or in healthcare, kind of think about what kind of challenges we have and how we can navigate through those challenges using what he calls practical wisdom. Okay, so safety culture pyramid. You've heard about safety culture a couple of different times, and what I have found when, uh, when the word or the term safety culture is used, most of the time the term is used to describe just a survey or an attitudinal measurement of the, what we call really climate. It's not exactly safety culture as a whole. It's really a snapshot at that moment, and that we call a safety climate rather than safety culture. So we put together this pyramid model that has at the base safety values. These are underlying values and unquestioned assumptions in the organization. So for example, uh, you may have in your organization the mission statement and values in the organization. Those are what I would call sort of advertised values, advertised mission statement. But then they may the actual values, the values in action may be very closely aligned with the espoused values, the ones that are on the bulletin boards and picture frames, or the actual values, enacted values, may be farther apart from those espoused values. 
And so that's the, the first or the basic place where we can start describing safety culture, the degree of separation between the actual uh, versus the espoused values. Next we get to safety strategies, and these safety strategies include policies, procedures, even leaders, and heroes that we celebrate in the organization. If you look at your award criteria, various awards that may be uh, in existence in your organization, what are the criteria on which you award those? Okay. So if you have certain criteria already outlined, then that will give you an idea about the type of leadership, the type of people that you really cherish in your organization. We have heard a lot about SMS, safety management system. Safety management system is a strategy that fits in that layer and it really helps sort of reinforce the type of culture that you want to build overall. The next higher level is the safety climate. And safety climate is typically measured in terms of surveys. So people do this survey uh, once a year, once every three years, or once when something went wrong and then now we need to find out what our safety culture is like, so we do a safety climate survey. So it's a snapshot of attitudes and opinions regarding safety. And then at the top of that pyramid is safety behavior, so safety performance. A lot of times we look at safety performance or safety behavior in a reactive way. Again, something went wrong, now we are going to investigate the incident and talk about what went wrong and why it went wrong and look at the specific people that touched the system, the patient or the airplane, and why they made that mistake. So looking at, typically looking at behavioral aspect of the individual and systemic aspect as to how the system really set them up for that failure. But uh, at that time, you're looking at behavioral manifestation of that safety culture. So when you put it all together, really that entire set from values to strategies to climate to behavior, all of them together form a safety culture. The other aspect of this safety culture pyramid is, I would argue that a safety culture exists in every organization. It exists in a certain balanced state, okay? So there are values, there are strategies, there are opinions, and there are behaviors. Now the state in which they all sort of stay in an equilibrium is the one that we need to spend more time on, whether that state is aligned more with a blame culture or a just culture. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. But the definition that we have developed for safety culture is a safety culture at an organization is dynamically balanced state resulting from the existing alignment of values, strategies, attitudes, and behaviors. So if you want to change safety culture, you have to shift that entire block and make sure that it stays in alignment in that new desired state. If you only try to change one of those elements, the rest of them will pull it back to its equilibrium and nothing will really last. And that's when people say, culture eats strategy for lunch. That strategy is that middle layer. Whatever strategies you put in, if you don't attempt to shift the values, if you don't attempt to change the attitudes, if you don't attempt to change the behavior at the same time or in some concerted way, then you're going to spring back uh, to the old culture. All right, so safety culture transformation. This is a, what we call an accountability scale. So on the left-hand side is a secretive culture. Next you have blame culture, then you have the midpoint, and then reporting and just. So generally you want the state of the safety culture to be somewhere to the right of that uh, continuum. If it's on the left of that continuum, then it's not really a desirable state. You all either have a blame-oriented culture or you have secretive culture. And generally, the terms blame, reporting, and just are more commonly used in the literature as well as in the uh, you know, typical safety parlance. You don't really hear much about secretive culture. So it's just in one organization that we went in and we asked about uh, what was going on in that organization and we thought we were going to find a blame culture and what we really found was secretive culture because a lot of people knew about the problems in the organization but they were so afraid to tell anybody, not even to their colleagues. They maintained their own sort of cheat sheets of the problems and that, that's when we realized that okay, this is really a secretive culture because 
they're not even uh, comfortable sharing issues with their colleagues because it is so bad. Okay, so now we're trying to move toward the leadership aspect. So let me just try and highlight some of the issues that tend to push us or sort of spring load us on the blame or secretive uh, side of the culture. And this is again mostly from field experience and data that we have collected over the years and mostly from the aviation side, but I'm sure a lot of that also applies in the healthcare side. So I'll try to make connections whenever I can to the healthcare aspect, but mostly my work is coming from aviation. So the first one is politics. We heard yesterday and sort of again reiterated uh, this morning that we have lots of project managers in DC and they tend to drive some of these initiatives and they tend to drive uh, some of the reactive components of it. When you think about aviation, also recognize that all of our congressional representatives fly, okay? So anytime there is a delay, somebody is going to call and ask for an explanation. And then that starts the rest of the day for air traffic, okay? So we keep chasing these kinds of issues from that reactive perspective. There are politics inside the organization as well. And those politics typically come from whatever labor management relationships you may have in the FAA technical operations alone, there are over 30 bargaining units. And they tell me that even their lawyers are unionized. So trying to get a cohesive agenda through that type of organization is incredibly difficult. Add to that our litigious society where even on the media side, anything goes wrong, immediately people will put a microphone in front of you and say, what do you think happened? Say, I just found out two minutes before you found out or before you showed up. So I have no idea what happened. But now, can you speculate? Can you tell me what you thought happened? A helicopter went down or an airplane went down. I have no idea. Let me check my phone and see if CNN has any updates and I'll repeat those to you. you know? But there is that tremendous pressure to start talking about blame, start talking about who made the mistake and what needs to happen. So that, that is definitely true in, in aviation and is also very true on the healthcare side, particularly when you start looking at the malpractice suits uh, in, in that area. The next one is financial penalties. Okay. Again, on the financial penalty side, I have a couple more slides. I won't go into too much detail on, on, on this one but the financial penalties come into effect sometimes even when the outcome is positive. And hold on to that thought, I'll show you a couple of slides that, that might surprise you. Then there's business competition. Now we have said repeatedly in this conference that safety is not a comp competition element. We don't compete on safety. And that is very well accepted in aviation that we don't compete on safety. We share a lot of safety data across uh, companies. And this morning you s heard from Captain uh, Almadar that a lot of the ideas for his presentation this morning came from two other airlines. So the video from the CEO, that idea came from one company. Some of the constructs that he presented in the SMS model, they came from another company and they are all competitors. But yet we share those data with each other. But at the same time, you've got business competition when the airlines as well as hospitals operate on a very, very low profit margin. I was really surprised about the profit margin. It's about one and a half to 3% if you're lucky. So when you're operating in that low of a profit margin, again, the, the cushion is very, very limited. And then we are taking, we are using such equipment that, that is very, very expensive equipment and cost, uh, uh, can cause a significant financial impact very quickly. So all of these are working together in a spring-loaded fashion to keep the organization in that blame or reporting blame or secretive uh, zone. 
All right, I'll skip through these slides quickly. We've got, we talked about politics. Litigious society, let me uh, call your attention to this one. This one is particularly interesting uh, example, uh, the Comair accident. The, on August 27, 2006, flight uh, 1549 departed basically from a wrong runway. So if you really reduce it down to its very, very simplistic elements, you'll say, well, the airplane departed from the wrong runway and the airplane crashed. So what are the next sort of set of events? The next set of events that are particularly useful in this conversation are that the families of the victims sued Comair, Comair sued the airport for its contribution toward the accident. And then the pivotal issue is that the plaintiffs sought copies of pilot reports filed by Comair pilots. These are, again, confidential reports filed by Comair pilots to, to demonstrate that the risk or the threat in this particular airport was a known threat and the company did not do anything about it. So remember we had conversation earlier today about hazard reporting and confidentiality of reports and how some of these reports are protected reports and so on. This is the time when the industry really found out that then the reports are not as protected as we thought they were protected. And so the judge ordered a limited release of these reports. Now this, this really, uh, set a shockwave in the industry because we take so much pride in maintaining that employee management trust, building these report systems and so on, but now that entire system was at risk. Long story short, we were able to recover from that, manage the, uh, to maintain or ke uh, keep the trust in that type of reporting system. The damage done was ne not nearly as large as uh, the industry was prepared for. But the other point here in terms of uh, bringing this up is that I think healthcare industry was much smarter in this and through the National Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act, you have a lot stronger protection for those types of reports. So I always say that healthcare has better lawyers than aviation does, so. All right, here's an example that all of us know very well. Captain Sully recovered from this situation and was able to land the airplane in Hudson. It's called the Hudson Miracle. Okay. Here are some of the other things that, that might be interesting to look at, and I know that you can't read that from the back, so let me just sort of highlight what, what's being uh, illustrated here. So these are, we map the stock prices of specific airlines as well as the industry average and looking, looked at uh, the events, certain events like value jet accident, TWA 800 accident, Alaska accident, 9-11 of course, and then American Airlines accident. So looking at those accidents, see what type of perhaps coincidental, perhaps correlational impact that might have had on the stock prices of that company. So what we discovered was after an airline accident, its stock tends to decline and it takes a long time to recover, if it recovers at all. The airline stock experienced what I call a negative spillover effect. That means regardless of whose airplane it is, regardless of whose tail it is, we all suffer. We all take a hit. The airline stock also experienced what they call switching effect. That means stocks of certain other airlines will go up. Okay. Here's what happened with US Air. Over on the left-hand side, $7.55, that was the price of the stock a day before the accident. Okay. It took more than a year, just about, uh, actually even after an entire year, the stock had not recovered to the same level as it was before the accident. So before the accident, $7.55. A year after the accident, still at $5.55. So what that really says, or what I'm trying to illustrate there, is there are huge financial impacts on the health of the organization as a result of, or coincidental to, correlational to, those types of accidents. So it's not just what you're able to save in terms of improving injury rates or improving 
uh, sort of lower level, low hanging fruit, but there are some really huge consequences to these events. Okay, so now how do we take all of these negative spring loaded pressures and start thinking in terms of practical wisdom? So in the literature, practical wisdom is defined as a disposition toward cleverness in crafting a morally excellent response to or in anticipation of, a ch of challenging particularities. That means you are a professional in your industry and you have all these negative pressures that are pulling the organization in a certain undesirable direction. Yet, as a safety leader, you're expected to be clever and morally excellent and find means to get to the other side. Okay. So sometimes in trying to get to that other side, it is so difficult because you have been immersed in that environment and you have been so challenged and overwhelmed by all those negative pressures that you can't really see a way out. Everywhere you try, you see all those spring-loaded forces that are pushing you in the negative direction. And that's why I think it is really important to immerse yourselves or expose yourself at the minimum to different industries, different people from different experiences. That way we can try to think, okay, how did somebody else try to solve that problem? And maybe there is a window someplace on this brick wall and you can start knocking on the window rather than continuing to hit your head against the wall. So in that standard for practical wisdom, we have morally excellent responses. That means going back to standard of excellence, standard of, of professional excellence. And a lot of conversation today and yesterday has revolved around that standard of excellence in the profession. Whether you think of it in terms of medical practice and what level of excellence or how do you define excellence in surgery, how do you define excellence in anesthesiology and various practices, or you look at it from the flight side and how do you define excellence and quality in flight, maintenance, air traffic control, and so on. But the focus is on practice, the professional practice. Uh, focus is also on activities rather than outcomes. And we heard some presentations again about how sometimes the outcomes themselves can be really misleading and we may be mis, uh, uh, aligned in focusing too much on the outcomes rather than the activities. The next one is a non-punitive error reporting system. I think that is also part of professional excellence. We should be able to build that as our professional expectation of one another and say if we make a mistake, it is expected to declare those mistakes, it is expected also to correct those mistakes and work on corrective factors. Challenging particularities, what are those challenging specifics in that discipline? Certainly you've got malpractice suits, you have profit maximization motive. If the profit is in that 1.5 to 3% range, you are so close to the edge so often that it's really, really critical that you're able to make sure that you've got at least a positive balance at the end of the day. In one conversation with an airline executive, you know, I was trying to uh, talk about a return on investment from safety programs to say, I can give you return on investment in 18 months, 24 months. It will take some time to get return on investment. And he says, Manoj, I don't have that much time. I have one quarter. What can I show in terms of results in the next financial quarter? If I cannot show positive results in the next quarter, there's no point. So on the other side, we've got, again, starting with standard of excellence, then regulatory requirements. But let me talk a little bit about just culture in the area of standard of excellence. Just culture ha puts emphasis on actions rather than outcomes, where if you speed through a traffic light, it doesn't matter whether you got caught or not, the fact that you sped through a traffic light, that is an issue, okay? So it's not whether you're getting caught or not, it's really about your underlying behavior. In one airline we talked about, they were actually rewarding people for turning the airplanes faster, okay? Faster gate turnaround was really a desired quality and people were cutting corners. But if that cutting corners resulted in damage, ground damage, then you got fined. So the same high risk behavior gets rewarded if it, is, if it supports the profit maximization motive 
but that same behavior gets penalized if you get caught or something bad happens. Okay, uh, the, eth the other ethical aspect of this is to make sure that the ethical decision-making process that you use is also, also includes improvement of the system as a whole. Going to regulator requirements, I won't focus too much on this. We've already talked about Part 193 protection and we talked about the National Patient Safety Act and looking at uh, protections awarded there. Uh, what I want to touch on is the International Civil Aviation Organization and looking at these umbrella organizations as well as JCO as to how some of these organizations can have a really positive impact or at least influence, if not impact, in uh, improving safety where you can uh, uh, sort of lean on guidance material provided by these organizations to try and cause some change in the specific local context. Uh, another quick one, I call these game changers. These are people, you have two different types of examples. One, the first example, John Golia, Jim Baylog, David Driscoll, those names may not mean anything to you, but these people are, are inside the industry trying to make a change from the inside, and these are all individuals trying to ch make a change. One was a union leader, the other one was an FAA representative, and the third one was a manager, okay? They're saying, we are the three key people, let's just start something. Let's just start turning the ship around. And they said, well, we don't have any paperwork, we don't have any policies to really guide our actions. And they said, that's okay, we get along, get along with each other, we know our motives, let's try to do something because what we have on the table is not working. The other one is a different case and a very, uh, again, interesting in terms of how that shaped sort of industry turnaround. And this is the Josie King case. And many of you in healthcare are very familiar with that case. So I won't go into the detail about the case itself. But w the point here is a patient or a patient's family member can also have a s very, very strong impact on the industry. It doesn't always have to be the physician or the hospital executive or somebody who is trying to enforce a certain policy. So the, the type of champions, the game changers that are really in the system are really amazing and, and what kind of um, effect they can have. Uh, coalitions, there are industry-wide coalitions that can also be very, very uh, helpful. You've got commercial aviation safety team that has been very effective across uh, the world actually. Uh, International Civil Aviation Organization as an organization has been very effective in causing several changes. On the healthcare side, World Health Organization has also taken up patient safety as a very critical initiative. And we are also seeing the uh, IHI initiative trying to build a coalition uh, in trying to improve safety across uh, a number of hospitals. This one, don't worry about reading the details. All it says is there were a number of different initiatives that were put in place by one hospital and as a result of those initiatives, they were able to bring down their sentinel events on a progressive basis. And as they brought down those sentinel events, their compensation payments kept coming down year by year. While we can all focus and celebrate the reduction in compensation payments, and this morning we also heard about reduction in insurance premiums, what I want to draw attention to is what happened to all those savings. If you go from $50 million in compensation payments to $250,000 in compensation payment, where's the delta? Where's that money? We were paying that money year after year. If you got $500 insurance break, what happened to that $500? Most of the times what we find is th that differential, that delta, that money got invested in something else. It never went back to a safety initiative or a safety program. So we really need to think about how we can invest it back into safety programs. I'm not saying all of it, but at least some of it, so that we keep the safety program healthy. Uh, this is a way of looking at uh, safety performance and mapping it, whether you're doing it on the aviation side or on the healthcare side. You've seen the Heinrich uh, pyramid before, the iceberg model before. This is basically the same thing, applying that uh, in, in those two contexts. Okay, so in conclusion, safety leaders are tasked to lead through practical wisdom. That means to find those morally excellent solutions, continuously work uh, to improve their profession, organization, and their industry through institu institutionalization of policies, procedures, practices that focus on excellence, the practice of excellence. 
I'll pause over there. I'll invite Dr. B about, and then we can take questions later. So our next speaker uh, is that of Dr. B about. He's a tenured faculty member here in the Department of Philosophy at St. Louis University. And he has special interest in the history of philosophy, and this is seen in his teaching and research areas focused on moral philosophy, especially applied ethics concerning professional and business activities. He's received many awards and honors uh, for his teaching. He's also a well-published individual with some three books, either authored or co-authored, working on his fourth book, and has also published over 40 articles and many reviews in scholarly journals. So please welcome Dr. Beabout. Thanks a lot. I'm glad to be here. Um, let jump right into this. Um, the title of my talk is Activities and Outcomes. So picking up on a theme that Minoj um, uh, mentioned, a uh, subtitle of my talk might be this, How Managers uh, Might Cultivate a Culture of Character and Safety. I'm going to be speaking in my role as a philosopher, last night in the social hour, I said to Lori, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, having to learn Greek and Latin, and I promised a little of that today, so let's do that. Uh, I'll be drawing from and explaining a distinction that's central to the philosophy of the ancient Greeks. This is that famous painting from uh, Raphael, the School of Athens. You see Plato and Aristotle there in, in, in the middle, uh, and this distinction is really crucial to their thinking, the same distinction that we've been talking about the last two days. So I'll try to uh, engage in a kind of retrieval of the insight from them and map it onto the discussion that we've been having. And I really want to bring into focus another thing that's been here in the background for us, an emphasis on character traits and character and how that's related to activities uh, and outcomes in light of our discussion of culture. Um, so here's one way to formulate my question. What's the connection between safety culture and safety ethics? Now, uh, that's a very appropriate question since the title of two of Minoja's books are exactly that, right? Safety culture and safety ethics. I want to focus on the in-between, right? How, how are those two connected? Um, so back to my title, activities and outcomes. Here's mapping my plan. After explaining the distinction between activities and outcomes and why it matters for safety ethics, I'll suggest that while there are good reasons for leaders to think that it's most important to focus on safe outcomes, let's pause for a second, what would those be? Well, if, if you're in the context of corporate capitalism, you've got to get a report out next quarter a financial report to show, you know, uh, then you have this incredible pressure. What's the outcome, right? Or uh, if we can, um, if you're in a context where there's ratings, right? Are we moving up in the ratings? Or um, are there incidents of uh, unsafe, uh, uh, unsafe incidents? So looking at outcomes, they're quantifiable, you can put numbers on them, they're measurable. There are a lot of reasons where we're inclined to think that's what we should be focusing on. Um, but uh, I want to reemphasize this theme that we've heard again and again over the last couple days, that it's actually better to develop a culture that prizes safe activities. To make my argument, first I want to clarify what I mean by calling activities safe. So, activities and outcomes, I want to emphasize safe activities and safe outcomes, but when I speak of activities as safe, think of the activities we've been talking about here, uh, cutting a human being with a scalpel, right? Uh, flying an airplane, right? Dealing with radioactive material, dealing with chemicals that can be very dangerous and so forth. Look at none of these things, in a certain sense, are safe activities. What, what I mean, right, all of you work in right, high risk, high consequence areas, uh, but I'm referring to the manner in which the activity is performed. Any of those things can be done right, in a safe manner. So in this sense, safety is always relative to the sort of activity in question. I drove here this morning in my car, in my automobile, and is that a safe activity or not? Well, it depends on the way you do it. My grandson, 
Um, now, one of his favorite activities is to drive. Uh, he really likes to drive, but here he is in my daughter's car. Thankfully, when my daughter lets him drive, she doesn't give him the keys. You can look at uh, my other grandson, his little brother, Joseph, who's not too confident in Matthew's ability to, uh, to drive in a safe manner. When Matthew gets in my car, I have a manual transmission, and I'm always worried that Matthew's going to, not just, he likes to steer, um, but that he'll uh, you know, grab the, the, uh, the stick shift and throw it into neutral, and I live on a hill, so I'm a little worried he's gonna end up, all right. So driving could be a very safe acti uh, unsafe activity for Matthew. Uh, I, I'm focusing not on safe activity in that sense, but what I'm talking about safety and activities, it's the manner in which it's uh, done, obviously. Um, to make this distinction between activities and outcomes, safe activities and safe outcomes, um, I'm gonna be drawing from the philosopher Alistair McIntyre and from his book, After Virtue. This is McIntyre depicted here uh, on the left. Uh, um, I consider Alistair McIntyre to be perhaps the most important moral philosopher of our day. Um, at his 80th birthday, we had a big event for him uh, here. You can see this wiseacre off to the right, myself, uh, uh, at, at that event. But uh, um, to, to, to make this distinction, and, and as I say, it's really a distinction that's found in Plato and Aristotle. McIntyre does it in chapter 14 of his book by telling the famous story of the chess playing child. Some of you might know the story. For those of you that don't, let me tell it to you. It's a thought experiment. He invites us to uh, imagine the following scenario. Suppose you've been charged with taking care of a seven-year-old child, a young boy. He's bright, intelligent, precocious. Um, and so you say to the child, OK, um, what are we going to do here? Do you like to play chess? No, I don't like chess. Well, have you ever played chess? No, I don't like chess. Um, well, what do you like? I like candy. Okay, um, I'll tell you what. I'll teach you how to play chess. We'll play a game of chess. At the end of the game, I'll give you 50 cents. You can buy some candy. I'm gonna play in such a way that it'll be possible for you to win. And if you win, I'll give you a dollar. You can have two pieces of candy. So the child agrees, he's motivated to play and motivated to win. And uh, so this is the famous story of the chess playing child. Uh, now, uh, you play the game, you give the child 50 cents, uh, the child gets candy, next week you come back, let's play chess again, and this goes on week after week. So imagine in this scenario, there's a knock on the door, or maybe your phone rings or something. You have to get up from the chess table, uh, the chess board. You return and you look at the chess board and think, now wait a minute, I thought I had more pieces than that. Is that really where all my pieces were? This something doesn't look right. Whose turn is it anyway? And the child says, it's my turn. He moves his piece, says, check. And you realize, wait a minute. I'm trapped. It's got me in checkmate. Now what just happened? <clears throat> you see, under these circumstances, the, the child has every reason to cheat and no reason not to cheat so long as they can get away with it, right? So uh, the, the, the only reason the child is playing, right, is to get an extra piece of candy. Uh, they're motivated to win precisely for that reason. Now change the scenario, say you come back the next week, the next week, the next week, this has been going on for a very long time. You show up one week, the child says, let's play chess. And you say, uh, I didn't bring any money, no 50 cents, no dollar, no candy, no chess. The child says, look, I don't care about the candy, the money, I just wanna play, let's play chess. Now, in this scenario, suppose the same thing happened. A knock on the door, a phone call, something, you're called away. Would the child, in this circumstance, cheat? I propose that they wouldn't. 
Why not? Now the child wants to play, why? For the sake of the game, for the sake of the activity, right? And, and under these circumstances, to cheat is also to cheat oneself, right? And, 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 and so now the child has learned something important, right? Uh, um, let's go back and review the story. There are several transformations in the story. First, the child went from not wanting to play, then to this instance of being motivated by money for candy. And in that circumstance, the child is tempted to cheat, right? Next, right, the child went from the state of being, right, uh, from playing for money to just wanting to play. What does it mean when the child says, I just want to play, right? I'm playing just to play, right? The child has come to learn that in the activity of playing chess, in the very practice of chess, there are a certain set of excellences or goods that can be pursued only in the doing of the activity. Um, in chess, what does that include? First, a certain kind of strategic imagination, anticipating if I do this, they'll do that, I can do this, they can do that, and, and, and so this ability to exercise one's imagination in a highly strategic way, um, a certain kind of analytic thinking, a special kind of competitive intensity, right? That all of these excellences can be pursued only in the doing of the activity. And so once the child comes to be motivated by the activity itself, right? One comes to see that cheating right, um, bars one from those goods in the activity. So McIntyre tells us this story Right, as part of his effort to retrieve the ancient emphasis on the virtues. The virtues are traits, traits of character and traits of intellect. So we might ask ourselves, what traits are needed to become excellent at the activity of chess? There are certain intellectual traits that are needed, focus, imagination, so forth, and also certain character traits, determination, perseverance, temperance. In the middle of the game, might, one might become distracted or, or all of a sudden one's desires might move in a different direction. I, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go, you know, I want to go watch TV. I want to go do this or I want to go eat something or, uh, or, or maybe um, you might have played uh, chess with a child where in the middle of the game, the, ch the child just looks at the chessboard and flips the whole thing over, right? They can't control their their desires or their passions. They need to develop patience, right? And even honesty and justice, that in the very playing of the game, right, um, a set of traits of virtues are cultivated and developed. Um, now, activities need institutions. This is true of chess. It's true of every single activity. Activities can go on for a while. But in order for the activity to really be sustained, the activity needs to be institutionalized. Chess is an activity, right? But a chess club is an institution. And as an institution, a chess club can organize tournaments, encourage participation, offer awards, prizes, so forth. Uh, in St. Louis, we have the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of St. Louis. I've listed their mission there. They're very involved with local schools. They're involved with uh, another institution, the Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts can get a merit badge for chess playing and, and so forth. It's also the case, I don't know how much you know about chess in St. Louis, uh, uh, across the street in DeBerg Hall, right next to uh, Minoja's office is the, uh, um, right, the Sinkfield State Room. Uh, a friend of the university, a graduate of St. Louis University, uh, Rex Sinkfield, uh, put forward the money for this. He also is uh, behind the Chess Club of St. Louis. The World Chess Hall of Fame and Museum is now in St. Louis. They have major tournaments next month. There's an open tournament if anyone would like to enter. Uh, you can still get your entry form into that. The prize for that tournament, I think, is modest, uh, four or $500, but in May, in May, there will be a major, I think the largest tournament in North America will be here in St. Louis. Uh, the winner will get, I think, $160,000. It's substantial. Uh, but 
compare that to other kinds of activities. Take golf, for example. There will be a big golf tournament next month, the Masters down in Georgia. There, I don't know what the, the champion will get, but more than $160,000. Uh, um, uh, or in St. Louis, of course, last fall, our St. Louis Cardinals uh, won the World Series, and I think they did better, most of them, than I hundred and sixty thousand dollars our friend our former friend the first baseman right we offered him a lot more than that and that wasn't uh, enough so uh, institutions right uh, support activities um, and those charged with leading and organizing administering those institutions right uh, have to set things up but they tend at times to be tempted to place their eye on other goods, money, right, uh, prestige, right, power, other sorts of things, and to forget their connection to the core activities that the institution is there to serve. The same point could be made with regard to uh, basketball. Uh, you know, the uh, NCAA basketball t uh, tournament began today. Our team there on the left is one of my students, Cody Ellis. He, uh, he was my student. I tried to teach him Plato and philosophy, the same themes that we're discussing right now in class in the upper right, our coach, Rick Majerus. Um, uh, on, the, on the lower part, I don't know if you can see here. Oh, I'm blocking out. Uh, this coach here is uh, Brad Stevens. He was the coach of the, uh, still is, I believe, the coach of the Butler team. Uh, the last two years, they came in second place in the tournament. Let's talk about him for a second, uh, in terms of outcomes in both of those games, um, it was a failure. The team lost, his team lost both of those games. On the other hand, with regard to the activity of coaching, um, I think most people who are familiar with the game think he was really excellent. He took a group of athletes that many people consider to be um, not superior uh, relative to the others and was able to um, get them to work together towards a common purpose, uh, figure out strategy, figure out how to coach them, uh, to bring them to the point where in the final second of the 2010 game, Gordon Hayward, who's pictured here on the left, had a last second shot. Had he made the shot, they would have won the game. Uh, now, to be an excellent coach, it seems to me, the task is to bring one's team as near as possible, right, to victory, right? So the outcome, victory is, is a goal in a certain kind of a way, but the activity of coaching involves pursuing this excellence that's internal to the activity at hand. Um, so too, I think, if you think about the institutions that are represented by the people here in this room, we could ask what traits are needed to become excellent at the activity of institutional leadership in a high consequence industry? Uh, it seems to me there are a set of intellectual traits that are needed and a set of character traits. Just like in chess, you need focus and imagination, but also, as Manoj mentioned, practical wisdom, along with a whole long set of character traits, determination, perseverance, temperance, patience, honesty, and justice. Practical wisdom in Greek is phronesis. How's that, How's that, Laurie? Thank you. Um, in Latin, um, Cicero translated this term that Aristotle used, he translated it as providentia, right? It means like divine foresight, right? Because uh, the divine, right, uh, in the ancient uh, Roman belief, the, the divinities could see far into the future. And this became contracted with our word prudence. So prudence has this sense, it's this intellectual excellence of being able to see long term, right, and, and know what's the right thing to do at the right time, in the right way, for the right reason. Um, it's this uh, calculating well towards some specific worthy end on matters where no exact technique applies. That's how Aristotle defines it. Dennis Moberg, who is the uh, recent president of the Society for Business Ethics, defined it, as Minoj said, a disposition toward cleverness in crafting morally excellent responses to or an anticipation of challenging particularities. 
Um, here's the takeaway point, I think. Right? I think there's a strong tendency to focus on outcomes, and I'd encourage us to focus instead on activities, right? And then to look at what is the excellence that's in the activity, whether it's the activity of chess, the activity of basketball or coaching basketball, or think of the activities that you're associated with in, uh, uh, in the healthcare se uh, sector, the activities of being a, a, a doctor, a nurse, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a radiologist, anesthesiologist, or in the aviation industry, or any of the other high consequence areas that are represented here. The, the people involved in those activities, right? some of them are there, you know, money for candy, but most of them have committed their lives to those things because they see those activities as worthwhile and that there are excellences in those activities. And there are a set of traits, intellectual traits and character traits that are needed uh, to pursue those excellences. The task of the institution, the institution is charged with housing those core activities, uh, sustaining them, and introducing uh, policies and procedures uh, that support the uh, those sorts of activities. So that's the case, uh, whether it's chess, the example that I've gone through, or basketball and coaching basketball, or the activities that you're involved in. So as Minoj asked us to, um, suggested that we should ask, what type of safety culture do we desire, right? How can we move from a culture, a secretive or blame culture, to a just culture? Um, and it seems to me one way to do that is to cultivate in ourselves and in those uh, that are in our organizations the set of traits that are needed uh, to engage in those activities well, including and especially um, the virtue of practical wisdom. So in conclusion, uh, here's, here's my point. While there may be a tendency for the leaders of institutions to think that it's most important to focus on safe outcomes, I want to suggest it's better to develop a culture that prizes safe activities, that is, activities that are done in a manner that's excellent and safe. Um, so I'm um, emphasizing not initially the outcomes, but the activity, trying to figure out what is the excellence in that activity, right? what traits are needed to pursue that, and how can the institution that you're charged with leading help uh, develop a culture and a set of procedures that encourage those engaged in that activity to pursue the excellence uh, that's in the core activity of the institution. Um, and I think what's needed for that is this virtue of practical wisdom, this uh, acquiring practical wisdom, as Minot says, takes experience relevant to the decision at hand. Um, uh, it requires morally excellent responses to challenging particularity. Oh, I don't know how that got stuck in there, but I just love looking at my grandson, both of them, especially the little one in the back. Um, for all of those that were charged uh, with, uh, with caring, let's hope that uh, you're as good as my daughter is at taking care of my grandsons here. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.